sense of, of uh, based on our sense of threat that uh, post September 11th, what did it take to be um, uh, American? Well, there was a grand sense of unity uh, for those who, who held on to a definition, but then there was a, a great deal of exclusion for people who just the day before would have been considered completely normal American citizens. Uh, but now something happened that the mechanism by which, or not something, uh, a very deep tribal instinct and in a great number of people uh, triggered a new cultural uh, definition of, of who is the us versus who is the them. Um, so these things uh, are, are understood and, and well-documented, um, and that develops with, uh, in a natural way, in an environment that it makes perfect sense in 300,000 years ago. Uh, we're just in a very different environment now, right? Our moral mechanisms, our, uh, our ways of, of processing, um, designed to work for hundreds of thousands of years, uh, in, in one context or in a global society with all the information in the world at our fingertips, not, not necessarily treating us so well, which is probably why we experience something that we call tribalism so frequently. A couple other things related to that that I'm, um, I just wanna name. Um, one is uh, that the book Moral Tribes by Joshua Green, which again will be, um, it's in the, in the notes I'll give you at the end, is a great look into how that morality develops and its limitations, um, utilizing a lot of uh, psychology and social psychology to help understand how we cooperate or do not cooperate. And I highly, highly recommend it to you. He is somewhere between agnostic and atheist and a utilitarian. That's what he wants to drive toward is a meta morality uh, in utilitarianism. I'm not endorsing that. I'm just, just offering it to you as, as for me, by far the best look at how our morality develops and the studies behind helping us to understand um, the mechanisms within us that allow us to cooperate or not cooperate and the failure of those things uh, to work for us in our current situation. And one of the things that Green talks about that's worth naming now is that our feelings, our emotional response to any given uh, moral dilemma that we're in, uh, he believes were designed to be a fast way of promoting cooperation within the group. That without thinking about it, we can say, ooh, that's not good. And, and just have that gut instinct that says, um, I shouldn't kill people. And that, that works for most people most of the time. Some people's mechanisms are faulty. We know that, right? And, and you've seen that before. And there are people who don't have the mechanism at all, uh, right? That there are, there are people who's, who's, who lack uh, morality. And I, and I don't mean like the people that you just think don't behave well. There are people, clinically speaking, who, who lack that emotional impulse that says, I should not do this thing. Um, and then you take that as an exclusion. Uh, it works most of the time which means that it's intended to derive quick responses, but some things are more complicated than that, or more complicated than our mechanism can bear. And so we have um, what functions as sort of a manual way of processing instead of an automatic way of processing. He likens it to a, um, a, a nice camera that has an automatic mode and it works very fast, but it won't take pictures that are quite as good or detailed as switching it over to manual mode and manually controlling and fine tuning uh, a lot of the details. Uh, the aperture or the shutter speed that to do that work is slower by definition but gives you the control that you might need in a more nuanced situation that one of our great uh, evolutionary benefits is ultimately having a brain that can do both and that we just don't always know when to switch into manual mode uh, sometimes we let our feelings win um, and then I, uh, one other thing let's see there, I'm, think, I'm looking at time here. Uh, maybe, yeah, one other thing real quick that, that might be helpful. We can return to another thing if it becomes helpful later. Yeah. All of this work is, um, leads us to an understanding, uh, and this is, again, still just the secular understanding, that, that we have an imperfect mechanism for understanding how we make decisions uh, as it relates to virtually anything, um, that our cooperation is 
is better suited for us than it is um, uh, for uh, an us versus them, a, a me versus us and an us versus them. Uh, so that, that's one piece. And then a second piece would be that um, the greatest kind of predictor then of how we engage as things become um, identifiable within the us, within the tribe, is not necessarily our individual belief, but instead it's frequently what is best suited for the tribe. And, and Green goes to great lengths to, to describe this, They uh, citing a number of different studies. One of them, one of my favorite ones to, to read about was on um, the risks of man-made climate change, that scientific literacy does not correlate to whether or not someone would name man-made climate change as a, as a risk, um, even just a health risk. That the only way to get a positive correlation to work within all the surveying they did was to regroup people according to um, political tribe functionally. And that that is what then defined whether or not a person would take the information in and then as an output have uh, language related to either positive belief in or negative belief against um, the, the negative consequences of, of climate change. Uh, and again, I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, feel free to, to check in later on. Um, I can point you to the book. I can't, I can't, I can't do much more than that. Um, but a really fascinating idea. So, uh, and that's, uh, and one, uh, just one extra piece on that uh, really quickly is that it's been exacerbated by uh, the advent of algorithmic engagement on social media platforms. And, and most recently, as we've heard a lot about, uh, about that from Facebook whistleblowers, uh, we, we get a good picture in. If you are in a situation where information is coming in and it's being engaged by your tribe in a visible way by the like button and the share button, and the algorithm is feeding you what you already want to hear, you're, we are so susceptible, and they know it, they're making money off of it, we're so susceptible to hearing what we want to hear and then believing what we want to hear and then promoting what we want to hear in a way that reinforces the tribe rather than causes us to uh, encounter new information or cross boundaries of division. It allows us to change the permeability of our tribal boundary to use Mary Douglas's terminology. Yeah. Okay, I'll breathe for a second and let some of that digest uh, and then talk about that from a biblical standpoint, which is where I'm a little bit more comfortable anyway. Um, so we might start back at the beginning in the same way that we did with a more secular view. So if a secular view is tribalism, as we move uh, sort of out of Africa, then <clears throat> we might look to the garden uh, for our understanding of humanity from a biblical uh, theological standpoint. Uh, and if you go back to the garden, and we had a reference to it in Carol's prayer, right? Created in God's image with the faculties uh, beyond that of, of other uh, creatures created for that garden. Uh, and then almost immediately, there is a fracturing of the relationship between one human and another, the only two humans. So we might as well just call them collectively humanity. Humanity exists now in a fractured relationship with one another and with God. Um, and, uh, it, and just worth noting before we move too far, the, the, the cause of that fracturing of the relationship is not the serpent. Uh, it's internal to humanity, right? That's one of the most important lessons to take away from that is uh, it's not that the the cause of temptation wasn't the wily serpent in, in Genesis. That's not the issue, but the action that causes the fracturing is the action of, of humanity. Uh, and then the problem is then internal rather than uh, thought to be purely external. Um, so we exist in this fractured state um, and, and the primordial mythologies move on from there. The primordial mythologies are those uh, stories that we talk about moving from the garden through the Tower of Babel um, and, and primordial primeval and mythology, not because they're not true, uh, really mythology because they're about meaning more than about historical fact, right? That's the way that we need to, to understand them. The truth of them is not that if you go to this place, you'll find the remnants of the Tower of Babel. That's not the point. The point is humanity moves to this place where that fracturing of relationship becomes almost a, per well, it becomes a permanent 
state of human nature that then takes root in the societies that we build such that we just can't help ourselves but try to uh, reach our way back into heaven and God can't be contaminated by our brokenness. So God confuses our language and spreads us across the face of the earth in the Tower of, of Babel. But every, if you go back behind that, from the story of Noah and, and several of the other stories that are in there, humanity's brokenness is um, it's kind of permeating the earth and, and collecting itself, aggregating itself in these, uh, these tribes, these cultures that we are developing. Um, and one of the important takeaways is that there is no utopian state. Nowhere that humanity goes outside of the garden uh, is there the possibility that we will take with us all the things that we need to make things perfect. Uh, the, the Bible's trying its best to tell us everywhere we go, we take brokenness with us. We take the fractured relationship with us. And uh, looking at time again, uh, if we keep going from there, I'll abbreviate major sections of the Old Testament really quickly. It just gets worse. How's that go? Is that, is that good for a, <laughs> right? That in, in the book of Exodus, fresh on the heels of God delivering the Israel or the Hebrew people from uh, Pharaoh at, at the Red Sea, People are already working their way into intertribal warfare and rebellion in the book of Exodus and Numbers. And you work your way into Joshua and Judges, and a lot of that is us versus them. A whole lot of it is us versus them. And when we kind of run out of enough thems, we start looking at each other as thems. Like it's, it's this constant movement toward um, violence, animosity. Um, what uh, a theologian named Rene Girard would say is, is that scarcity often drives us toward uh, mimetic violence, meaning that we begin to see in one another a rival that we must defeat in order to compete for scarce resources like land or, um, or food, right? And, uh, and we can't seem to escape it. Um, so what Gerard, Gerard says, and, and what I would say as well, is that Jesus is in many different ways the, um, the way in which we overcome that model. So there are probably six different ways we can talk about this. I'll, I'll try not to talk about all six of them, but in some ways we understand Jesus to be um, the redefining of the human mold which is, again, this is, these are, this is metaphorical language, but if, like, if uh, every human being since Adam and Eve were kind of cut uh, from the same mold, uh, there's something wrong with the mold, right? And so our human nature is such that, that we carry this flaw, and Jesus comes without the flaw. Um, Gerard, Gerard says that, that he turns the tables, or overturns, the system by which we scapegoat, taking that mimetic violence that's constantly ramping up, and then we put it off on somebody else. We make a new them so that we can be us again, and we kill them or otherwise harm them to get rid of them so that we can have this common enemy. Even if that enemy is understood to be sin, uh, in the Old Testament, you put that sin on a goat and send the goat to the wilderness. Right? There's a, there's a, there must be a way. The irony is that what was supposed to happen from Gerard's perspective was that then we stopped. And what ends up happening is that we ritualize the sacrifice so that we don't have to stop doing it. Um, so we perpetuate the, the mimetic violence. Um, we just move the tension somewhere else uh, and hold on to our ritual. That's a complicated thing. I expect we'll come back to that one. Um, so, so those are a couple of ways. Jesus teaches with parabolic teaching. Um, almost forcing us to reconsider our moral mechanism frequently. How many of the different parables of Jesus calls the people who are interacting with Jesus to stop and say, wait a second, um, whatever moral reasoning I brought to the table or understanding of the law or whatever it was is not going to work right now. The parable of the Good Samaritan, perhaps the, the great example for the case uh, of, of tonight's conversation, um, the moral mechanism to understand who is the good us and that fails and, and causes the tribal boundary to break. Um, uh, and then just finally, one other thing that I'll say, because it's important for where I think uh, this will go, is that, that um, Jesus 
is always willing to encounter somebody across the boundary of division um, or the, bound, the, the permeable or impermeable boundary that causes a, a religious group, in this case, to define an us. Prostitute, tax collector, sinner, whatever, leper, uh, people who are outside of the boundary, Jesus is moving across that boundary all the time in order to, uh, to redefine what, what the tribe might mean. Um, so a couple of quick words uh, on where the scripture ultimately hopes or, or shows us that that will lead. Um, and that is that with the work of Jesus, we can return to a, a, a utopia of sorts. Um, in Revelation, we get a picture of a new heaven and a new earth, which no longer has scarcity as a, uh, as a backdrop for our interactions with each other, which no longer has strife or violence. And the flaw of the human condition has been removed. Uh, Jesus himself talks about the movement toward having one flock and one shepherd. That comes from John uh, chapter 10. And, uh, and seems to say to people already gravitating toward a new tribe centered around him that there would be uh, more to it than that. And importantly, where the New Testament goes, and much of the Old Testament uh, is there also, is that the work of moving beyond our human flaw is not really our work. Um, that we, we have no uh, health in ourselves to help ourselves as the old prayer goes, that, that because of our faulty faculties in a certain sense, um, we'll probably never finish the job. And so it's our hope that God will finish the job for us. But that doesn't mean that there's nothing we can do. And that's really important, that if we know that that's where we end and that God is ultimately going to have to get us there because without God, we're going to take our fractured relationships everywhere we go. Um, but what do we do in the meantime with the time that we have and the relationships that we have? And there are a couple of things that I think can be uh, really helpful. So uh, one is the practice of reconciliation. Um, uh, a wonderful Christian practice that I, I hope you know well. And I don't mean the one that you find in your prayer book necessarily. But instead, we see that, that forgiveness kind of only goes so far. And beyond forgiveness, there has to be another layer. So, so really quickly-ish, by forgiveness, what I mean is that when we, when we have the capacity to enact justice on another individual, and we choose not to, that's forgiveness. I'm forgiving this person a debt. I am providing mercy such that they don't have to face the, the condemnation or sentence that is due them. That's, that's forgiveness. But that doesn't restore a relationship between me and that person automatically, does it? Um, that practice of restoring the relationship is the practice of reconciliation. You can actually hear it in the word reconciliation, right? Um, to be reconciled is to once again be together and so the practice of Christian reconciliation is to, um, to not only practice the forgiveness that allows you to get back to kind of square one, but then to think together about a, a mutually agreed upon future, hopefully one that aligns with God's will, and move, walk in that direction again together. Um, I wouldn't say that Christians are uniquely suited to do that, but it is absolutely a condition of our calling. If you kind of read the New Testament, we get... Um, this great language from Paul, who says this all the time, um, that we are ambassadors, this is famously from, from 2 Corinthians, we are ambassadors of the reconciliation, that were it not for God's desire to not only forgive, but then to reconcile, we wouldn't have life, and that it is um, our absolute purpose as followers of Jesus, then to practice that with one another. Um, so, uh, I would like to say more about that and probably will, but, but uh, not now. Uh, just take that for what it is. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, we have a practice of humility, and that's related to this. That's really important that we practice repentance. Now we can go back to that prayer book uh, stuff. Uh, that we must have the ability to recognize in ourselves um, imperfection. Uh, and see in ourselves that we don't always get it right, 
that breaks down some of that tendency within us to name the other person as a them uh, versus the us. If we see ourselves instead as all broken in a certain way and doing our best, then it steps down often uh, a sense of judgment. Um, Paul, again, uses this to great effect. Romans is a community that's deeply divided over tribal affiliations. And Romans starts off with this great argument uh, pointing to the notion that every single one of us, regardless of any state that we have been in, uh, we have all, in Paul's language, sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the only reason he really writes that is then to promote, ultimately, the ethical side of his writing, moving after chapter 12, uh, moving through especially 14 and 15, that whether or not we are Jewish Christian, Gentile Christian, whatever our, our kind of religious status, whether or not we practice Sabbath on Friday or Saturday or eat meat or don't eat meat, whatever, that we are one. And what makes us essentially one is that we're all broken in need of grace. Um, we're in, in tremendous need of grace. If we can approach from that place, we can uh, we can not hold on to that sense of self-righteousness that causes us to say, well, these people are potentially outside of the bounds of love. Um, uh, Paul, in that same writing and a few other ones, will tell us that the practice of charity, and this actually is agreed upon by those who write about tribes from the uh, secular perspective, that the practice of charity, of giving, especially across boundaries of division, is, um, is an incredible practice for breaking down tribes. So Paul encourages people in Rome who have a distant relationship, we might say, from those in Jerusalem, to give a gift to the people in Jerusalem, even though there's been animosity between the two of them, as a way of fostering a relationship that can ultimately break down some of those walls. Um, we can practice parabolic thinking. I'll come back to this, I'm sure, as well. But that the reason Jesus teaches in parables is that we can stop the automatic process and embrace a manual process that causes us to go deeper. So we, we can practice that as individuals as well, frequently, not just as we encounter the parables of Jesus, but um, our, our ability, our capacity to hold on to things that strike us as paradox can be incredibly important to dwell in uncertainty. Um, very few things have such easy answers that, that we benefit from removing nuance. Um, intentionally crossing boundaries of division, encountering, that's another critical thing that we practice, right? Outreach and, and mission. Um, Outreach and mission is often self-serving, and that's not a bad thing that we, as Brian, uh, not uh, Brian McLaren, oh, why is his name escaping me all of a sudden? Poof, gone. We go to the, the margins uh, to meet Jesus there. Um, that's the, the line that I'm looking for, uh, that, that getting out of the walls of our church, moving beyond our tribe toward someone across a boundary of division, practicing the mission of Christ in the world, causes us to encounter people who are very different than us. It's if we stay in the tribe that's moving through, we get to practice our mechanics in a way that uh, doesn't suit us in this current world, right? It only works if we're an isolated tribe somewhere and we're not. And so constantly moving through life in such a way that we encounter people with differing views, differing uh, practices of, of, of ritual, of meaning making, of language, so on and so forth, can can be a great antidote to tribalism. Uh, and then we practice love. Um, uh, as one uh, secular, I think he would refer to himself as an atheist, if not an agnostic, who writes a lot about this. Uh, Jonathan Haidt says that we, we need to move toward engagement, not attack. Um, that's not something we're fond of doing right now. When I say we, I just mean collectively our society. Um, we have a tendency to say it's either this or that. And if you can't get with, with this, then I'm not going to engage you anymore. I might attack you or I might be indifferent to you. Um, if I have enough time, I'll come back to some of Brian McLaren's statements about how the us versus them relationship can work. Um, the one that, that McLaren will ultimately write that matters most is creative participation. If we look with somebody who is representing a different tribal position than we do, remembering that largely our tribes are, um, are, are 
fictitious at this point. Um, and we look at that as an opportunity to participate with somebody creatively. Now, often we find a way forward that is better than what either one of us would have come up on, with on our own. This is one of the reasons that you'll hear me call myself like this pragmatic centrist. It's not because I don't have my own opinions about whatever thing and lean one direction or another on any given thing, um, but because I really do believe that, that in the synergy that happens in bringing different ideas to the table, we have an opportunity to find uh, ways forward that we might not have come up with if everybody practiced the tribal affiliation. And so that's one other practice that I want to say that I find uh, important, and that's keeping people at the table, uh, keeping people at the table long enough that they might stay there, even if I have a deep conviction that they need to change, which is a marker, certainly, of, uh, of my tribal affiliation, but it might not be wrong. It doesn't, but just because it might be my tribal affiliation doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong. Uh, so if I really think that this person needs to change their opinion, no amount of evidence, and this is proven from that, those studies on um, psychology and social psychology, no amount of evidence is likely to convince that person to change their mind. But encounter often does. Encounter often allows for that almost eroding of a person's automatic mode for, uh, for judgment to shift. And that encounter, it's my timer so that Carol doesn't have to get onto me. Uh, that, <laughs> that encounter, that process can actually move to shape people. What I would say is keep people at the table long enough to be shaped by love. Um, and if that can happen, then there is uh, a hope in all of us that we can move beyond our tribal distinctions. So I want to just name two other things in closing. And, and then, gosh, I left a lot of material on the table that we can come back to. And I know it went fast, but we have time to talk. Um, one other thing is just a thing as it relates to the institution. And, and I want to say this as a rector of a church that most of you are members in. And also because I anticipate a, a lot of you have had questions about things like, you know, why don't I have a mask mandate during this season or that season or whatever. And, and one of the things that, that I aim to, to practice here is to distance from our center the perspectives that are strong in identity, but hostile toward those who don't share that identity. And <clears throat> that's very difficult. And, and I'm not always going to know exactly where those things are. Uh, but they're on the left and they're on the right, and sometimes they're in the middle. And, and so I try to pay careful attention to, um, are these instances in which um, hostility is being fostered? And if I can avoid in those moments, uh, centralizing the language of the hostility, I think I'm doing something of my job as a leader. But next to that is to embrace at the center um, institutionally, the center, a strength in, in identity that has benevolence toward those who are beyond our tribal affiliations and boundaries. That's really critical to me. Can we have, this is McLaren again, can we have a, a strong benevolent identity, one that inspires us by the strength of it with no hostility toward another? Christians have not often gotten that right. And uh, it's certainly something that I want to uh, do my best to practice. Okay. And then how about this? The last thing I was going to share is a prayer and I won't do it. I'll pass it to Carol in the chat so that she can have it or Bob can have it at the uh, close of our, of your time together. How about that? How about that? It's a prayer from the prayer book. It fits uh, hand in glove with the one that Carol had earlier. Thank you. Uh, Mike, you had a you had a question. Mike Tompros, you need to uh, unmute. I do. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thanks, Remington. Uh, yeah, Mike. A lot, a lot of what you talked about was way above me because I have a civil engineering degree from Georgia Tech and I'm kind of equals <laughs> MC squared, mm -hmm. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And the derivative of variables, the rate of which change in different environments. And see, oh, I didn't understand a word of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I, I got some of yours, but not all. Now, well, he, he I, mentioned I, parabola, so you should relate to that. Oh gosh, come on! Don't 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 test me on that. <laughs> um, 
I, I know and work with and love a lot of people in ministry that are on this call. Um, the uh, I, I, I want to get back to the uh, concentric concentric circle thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think everything that you said past that was a, a way to get outside of your target point in the circle. And it, I think, uh, I, I think we don't, and I don't participate in social media, so I don't know mm. anything about that stuff. But um, I think the uh, um, the question I want to ask is: if, some, if I'm at a target in my concentric circle, and somebody is at their target point in another concentric circle, what I've found is just don't talk about stuff mm. that don't overlap. Yeah. Uh, and um, I think within the church, uh, at least I try to do that. And, you know, oh, I've, uh, you know, uh, I, and it's okay. Is that, the, is that the right way to look at that? Just don't worry about what you don't agree on or, uh, and I'm not talking about, about necessarily politics or way of life or money or anything, but is it is it appropriate just to not worry about the other person's concentric circle? Yeah, it's a good question. So <clears throat> it, it likely depends on uh, what the piece of the circle is and how uh, valuable it is. We we might say so, um, and and by that I mean mostly to to you that that. Um, in the in the old church language, we talked about uh, adiaphora. Like these things that just kind of aren't aren't important. Important. Your your football affiliation, if it causes any issues, it's not actually that important. Well, being a Georgia but, Tech guy, that that's yeah, easy for yeah, you to that's, say. Especially this, yeah, <laughs> this recently. Um, but but other things are of of tremendous value, or by necessity, are going to cause us to to have some sense of conflict. And in those benevolence, if we want a strong and benevolent tribal identity, then benevolence, instead of saying this is not important and I don't want to do it, benevolence often instead looks like this is really important and you and I disagree about it completely. And that drives us to very, very different conclusions about how we ought to live. But I don't have to fight you on it right that are our, our, our <clears throat> there the perception of threat is probably not what it ought, what how i'm holding on to it or how you're holding on to it and so let me i want to say maybe two things about that one is again going back to like romans romans uh paul ultimately says look your your conviction about the practice of sabbath on this day or that day it's not that that's not important that's really important just don't let it drive a wedge between this community. The, the higher goals of the community um, need to stay, the main thing needs to stay the main thing. Um, and that, that I think frequently gets us out of a number of different binds. Same also goes with uh, sort of religious pluralism, right? I don't wanna um, ignore the distinctions between Christianity and Islam. Uh, that's not my intent. I wanna be able though benevolently to celebrate that's different than my thing. And, and so drives you to different conclusions than my thing drives me to. And that's yours and this is mine. Um, there's still a third thing. And that third thing is when we're in direct competition for let's say a resource um, or, or actions that affect both of us deeply. And there what we, what we have to do is find ways to engage and, and move through um, these, in some cases, the overlapping concentric rings, um, but move through that in such a way that we come to a conclusion that is representative of what cooperation might look like. Um, and that's, that's really, that can be really, really difficult. So y'all, some of you have heard me say this before, there are plenty of things that St. David's ought not engage in from the perspective of we're not going to be able to find a cooperative, we're not going to find common ground. And, and if we do, we may not find common purpose. And if we do, we may not find common action. Uh, that our value systems, our, our tribal affiliations might not lead this church comprehensively to be able to say like, okay, we're all going to do this. And so maybe 
there's something else that we should target. Um, uh, there are those, those occasions. And then there are other times where, unfortunately, evade as we might like to, it, it won't happen. Um, one last thing that I, I mentioned just glancingly, uh, there's another great study about um, uh, the sort of escalation effect that, that like if, if I have a machine that pushes on me with a certain amount of force, and then I try to replicate that force when I push on you, Mike, and then you try to replicate that force when you push back on me, that we will always push harder on the person than the push that we received. It's, it is, it's been demonstrated so many times. It's so beautiful. And so we escalate very, very quickly with one another. And Gerard talks about this from the perspective of Mises. All the different people I named uh, talk about this at, at, in different uh, ways. Um, and so that perception of threat often ratchets up and makes us close down the, the rings, right? Close down the boundary and such that's not permeable. And your ideas can't flow toward my ideas and my ideas can't, and sharing of resources isn't gonna happen. Commerce isn't gonna happen. Those things, we, we, we've got to avoid that when possible and recognize that our, again, our faculties for perceiving threat, danger, and the intent of the other person to, uh, to deliver uh, are not as trustworthy worthy as we sometimes think that they are. And that's for all of us. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mike. It's a great question. Uh, can I use one specific example that, uh, that pertains to the church when, um, uh, shoot, it's 15 years ago now that, uh, the, the church, uh, American Episcopal Church, uh, um, uh, recognized the first gay bishop, Oakland mm -hmm. gay bishop in New Hampshire or Vermont or whatever it was. And uh, at that time, we had a man named Father Paul Winton. And I disagree with him a lot of things, but I agree with him a lot of things. But what he said was that doesn't affect us because different people had strong feelings one way or the other. We lost some families over that. Probably. Sure which was really unfortunate. So I think what you're saying is if it doesn't affect us, leave it alone. And we as a church would say, leave it alone. Um, so I would have said that a little bit differently in that um, almost everything does affect us in some way or another. Um, the, the, the more we understand about our engagement in the universe, um, the, the harder it is to, to deny the effect of one thing or another. But I might've said, um, uh, and, and there's a whole other thing. As I look at one of my archdeacons, I think, well, there's also a thing about polity that we can talk about. But, um, but if I were to extrapolate this out into a number of other uh, conversations that, that might function the same way, instead, what I might say is, we're clearly not of one mind on this. And some people's impulse will be to retreat into a safer mode of being. And some people's will be to, um, to now claim a new dominant status quo. And and to pit ourselves against one another. And that that is um, antithetical to the gospel, that we have work to do. And some of you are happy about this and some of you are mad about this. And that we have to find a way to move together with this. And so let's do that work. Um, so again, as a centrist, especially in the, the today's uh, world, what often happens when people do that is say, nope, I'm going to go to the church where I can not do the work and find the people who agree with me already. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I, I've been there. Uh, I've certainly been there. Um, but I think that that's how I would, I would say it if, if, uh, if given the opportunity and, and I'll, I'll be given the opportunity because the stuff comes around uh, daily. <laughs> so it's gonna, it's gonna be here. Um, and something of that magnitude will, will certainly come around as well. Um, if, if, I guess, regardless of what I would personally hold, my hope would be that we stay at the table long enough to encounter love and, and encounter one another uh, in such a way that we move forward with a sense of, of unity. That can't always happen. And that's important to note, right? Sometimes we just have to say, this, this unity is gonna have to come by the final acts of Jesus' redemption. And, uh, and in the meantime, I'm going to try to be humble and avoid self-righteousness. I'm going to try to practice forgiveness and reconciliation. I'm going to try to encounter people who are different than me. All those sorts of things that we talked about uh, 
as, as potential practices to help us. Thank you, Mike. Um, Patty, did you Thank have you. a question? Thank you. You're, you're muted. I did, sorry. Um, I did. I, the, the idea that scarcity drives us towards violence, you know, you mentioned that and 100% agree. I mean, it brings out the fear in all of us, I think. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and you're, um, it's more of a comment, I guess, than a question, but the idea of, you know, visualizing us sitting at a big picnic table with one pie on it and how we're going to split that up without killing each other, mm -hmm. you know, because we all want some of it. And, um, and the idea of, um, you know, changing someone else's mind, you know, or, or maybe my mind will be changed. Maybe I've become more observant and, and can see somebody differently than I expected them to be. Um, so I, I think, I, I think we learn from that, you know, rather than always being self-righteous to let somebody else in the door and hear them, you may not agree, but at least listen to it. And mm -hmm. hard as it may be, um, I think, you know, we grow from that. And do I have to even have a smidge of the pie? You know, can I live without it? You know, so, um, but the fear, the internal fear, the natural instinct of our nature as humans to um, survive, I think, yeah. drive out of that. And, Right. So, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, we'd say that this, this is the backdrop that f forces evolution, right? There is, there is no adaptation if there's not some sense of scarcity mm -hmm. that causes one to have an advantage over the other as they adapt. Mm -hmm. um, but it becomes such a part of us biologically that, I mean, those of you who have had children, you can see it so quickly in the lives of our kids that mm -hmm. you don't have to wait for them to like grow up and, and embrace this flawed human state uh there's one toy i want that toy <laughs> you know like uh, that, that we have a tendency to to move through that and it's not it's not in and of itself wrong right uh, that we can use a lot of value neutral terms on this it's just something that we could overcome in order to move to a place of greater well-being for for humanity um, um you know one other thing that that i want to say uh, just because as you mentioned, Patty, like, can I just sit and listen sometimes to, to the person with very different, differing perspectives? Um, because I've stripped a lot of nuance out of my own uh, way of representing this. There are times where that's not the right thing to do. Like if you don't have to sit and listen to somebody who wants to make a, like a serious attempt to justify slavery, Oh, well, yeah. you don't have to, you don't have to listen, right? Like there are convenient ways and it doesn't mean that that's not a, an exercise like worth doing. It's just, uh, oh gosh, there's a great, um, well, there's a, a great parable about that, that I, I would struggle too much to, to remember, but, but functionally, um, you can just say that's not, that's not worth the time. Yeah, my values. Those right. aren't my values. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, like this is, this is a conversation that has been concluded, um, mm -hmm. right? No, no, that's that's uh, good enough. And there are conversations like that. There are a lot of conversations that are not like that. So we have to have some discernment about uh, which mm -hmm. conversations are those conversations. And that's that's sometimes difficult and where community can help a great deal. True. Thank you, Thank you Patty. Um, Lee, then Tom. I think Tom has a question, uh, but Lee first. Lee Hunter. I'm here. I'm here. Um, so I have a lot of things kind of going through my head. One, you just sort of answered, cause I was going to say, are there like make or break issues? Like there may be an issue that I, 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 maybe I can listen, maybe I can't, but I, I really am just going to move on from that. It doesn't mean that I don't care about that person or can't be in relationship with them in other ways, but, but it's really hard if it's one of those core issues that we that I feel so strongly about and I know there's not a whole lot of them but there's two or three and I just kind of think about in what you're saying you kind of addressed that a minute ago that sometimes we can we can just move on we don't have to stay it and engage with, with something that's so antithetical to our beliefs right right and especially if that isn't drawing the community toward um, a way of utilizing a resource right that that um oh gosh i mean we could pick half a dozen of the topics that common purpose has probably talked about in the past and say okay um there's not going to be agreement between like the 
the Republicans and the Democrats on the call. Okay. Um, is the church seriously debating whether or not to like do some huge action on this and, and allocate a large portion of the budget to that action? Um, if not, then at least from the standpoint of church as the group in which we might encounter one another, uh, we can probably just say, Ooh, I really disagree with that person and come from a very different value proposition about how I engage. And, uh, and that doesn't mean I can't like that person. Maybe we're not going to talk about this or, uh, or maybe, um, maybe we should be really careful about a lot of the things we talk about. All that's, all that's fair and, and, and kind of okay. Um, and then come back to the internal work and say, okay, now, why is it that I believe strongly the things that I believe? And how is it that I am practicing the love of my neighbor, uh, especially as it relates to this neighbor? I mean, Jesus really, we talked about this in the forum last Sunday, two Sundays ago. Um, Jesus does not let us off the hook for the call to love our neighbor and defines neighbor in such a way that it includes our enemies. And all of a sudden, uh, we have some real spiritual work to do. So this person with whom I disagree so greatly and is on the other side of this fence, now that I've created a sense of like space, now what do I do? Um, yeah. Moves the question. What uh, the secular uh, humanists that I've named uh, would say is that, um, that we, we've got to find a meta morality that unless we can all agree that science delivers this and then we can just put everything into an excel spreadsheet and and know how to allocate resources that we're not hopelessly lost but we're going to be moving through this perturbative way of of, of dealing um there there may be enough in that that christianity can also hold on to that but i think for us when we go a step further we say um without the meta morality the the question remaining for me is um, how do I love as well as, as my constitution will allow me to love? Uh, my, my measure of faith uh, will allow me to love. Can I, I'm going to, now I'm going to ask a different question. I'm sorry. Can I do that? Um, I, sure. Right, right. Before just, Tom I, I, does. <laughs> okay. So my other thing was about thinking about tribalism and you used the example early about climate change and how people were more likely to answer that question based on their political party. And it's made me think um, about the, the us versus them. And I may be completely wrong because I don't have any historical context. I only have my own life. And, but I'm thinking that we seem very connected to this us versus them mentality right now. Um, I see it in myself. Sometimes the, it's kind of like you said about exerting pressure. The more one side says, that seems so crazy, then I go further over here. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? And it's harder to stay in the middle. But I was also thinking about when you mentioned, you know, football and being coming together. Um, I was thinking some of the most immediate joy I can feel is being at a huge sporting event because everybody, yep. I, I will tell you the Yahoo's next to me, I may not have anything to do with them on any other given day. But when we're all there cheering for, you know, whatever team it is, the Braves, for example, there's this huge feeling of community and belonging and that we're all into this together. And it may not last that long, unfortunately, but it's just it's just a great feeling. And I think about that versus how most of the time we feel or I feel kind of just stuck in my own little safe mm -hmm. tribe or space mm -hmm. um, that we long. I long for that big feeling. Yeah, yeah, very good. So, so right. I mean, that's that's a way of talking about the social psychology so directly. We were built to feel that way when we cooperate together. When there is this bigger thing than me, and I'm participating in it with others, um, gosh, the dopamine flows, and and it feels amazing to do that. And and we want to to foster that. And generally speaking, we want to foster that in ways that are benevolent toward others. Most of the time we end up with a sense of, of uh, sort of hostility that happens at, in like our reptilian brain, right? Even just the kind of like, again, at a, at a very benign level, uh, we'll keep using football as an example, like, you know, beat the yellow jackets, that sense of like, ah, get, stick it to them, um, which is just ridiculous, but it, like it, it, it hits that button so well within us. 
and it's uh, and it's great. And actually, uh, for what it's worth, Rene Girard, who I'm named a couple of times, uh, would suggest that um, from gladiatorial games to to college football, uh, that we've created those as ways of not killing each other. Uh, we let them do it on the field to trigger that button within us, so that we don't end up carrying that need uh, in our in our other other uh, tribal lives. Um, <clears throat> so. So yes, um, and then next to that is, is, can we replace the hostility with benevolence? And I didn't, I didn't pull it up uh, for time's sake, but uh, McLaren, Brian McLaren, uh, in one of his books, uh, Why Did Jesus, Moses, Muhammad, and Buddha, or Buddha and Muhammad, Cross the Road, uh, long title, uh, says that that we the us versus them can actually take. Uh, he named seven different forms. Um, so us versus them is really a, um, a, a domination form, but sometimes the us versus them takes the form of assimilation. Like they must become us. Um, and, and it's not uh, over and against, but instead the, they have to assimilate into us or uh, us overturning them is, is revolution, which he names. Um, we have to cleanse ourselves of them, uh, purification model. Uh, uh, and, and ironically, uh, in some cases, uh, they lead into each other, right? So, so uh, the Puritans uh, practiced that purification model um, after having been dominated by, by the, the larger group uh, that rejected them. Uh, a competitive model is one that he names as a negative, and I'm not sure it always is, um, but us as a rival against them, I think there can be a way of doing that that um, sort of honors our, our human nature and doesn't try to destroy the other. Uh, there's, I'm gonna forget the author, uh, and I've been, uh, it's been years since I've read this, but there's an author that talks about um, human society as it relates to uh, beehives and ant colonies that like ant, ant colonies might fight one another for territory um, but very rarely are they hell-bent on the destruction and genocide of the other uh, ant, ant colony they recognize somehow that they can have a turf war and then settle it um, they compete and um, an absolute structure destruction is not the goal uh, i think i think we can compete without destroying um, and then uh, two other ones that he names that are just worth mentioning. Uh, one is isolation. Uh, I got to get away from them. And, and Mary Douglas talks about this a great deal with a concept called grid and group that's worth looking at, that we move to enclaves. That's happened a lot um, in, uh, in recent times with pressure at the center. People have moved to a protected sort of subculture, um, generally with a charismatic leader at the center because that's the only way to organize resources. Um, you've got to kind of give some power over, um, but otherwise uh, uh, the idea is, is to remove ourselves from, uh, from the center. And then another one is uh, this kind of self-preservationist. It, it functions a little bit like isolation where it's, it's them over us. That actually is also tribalism. Um, still distinguishes the us them divide it just recognizes power on the other side uh, which is really tricky i experienced that most vividly in israel um, watching uh, uh, orthodox jews who have tremendous political power in israel or especially at the time that i was there um, act out of a complete state of victimization in certain scenes that i was in um, and I was there for, for to, to be a part of those scenes uh, in particular. This wasn't like a religious pilgrimage exactly. Um, and it was just fascinating. It was as if, you know, um, it was as if a couple of decades worth of, of political development had never happened. Uh, it's just wild. So, uh, so anyway, we can do, we can do a lot of different versions of, of, uh, of our tribal us versus them. They don't, they don't always look like uh, just direct, destructive hostility. Uh, Tom Erdmanchik, and then Meredith and Sue. Okay, Tom, I'll, you had a question. 
Yeah, I'll try to be brief. I think part of this has already been answered um, in a general sense. But so Remington, you talk about keeping people at the table. Mm. And so assuming that the table is the altar and maybe the table is the altar at St. David's Church, how do we keep people from different tribes at that table long enough that we can all be shaped by love? Um, are there any specific strategies that you've experienced or any suggestions that may work? Yeah, yeah, it's a good, uh, good way of thinking about it. I think that the altar is a table uh, and one in which we, um, we return to this kind of paradigmatic way of, of practice. But I don't, it's not the table that I'm talking about um, in this case, um, because there's not enough quality of encounter there. Um, uh, and so, <clears throat> you know, the, the you know, ultimately uh, common purpose has this capacity. The rector's forum has been uh, remodeled to try to, to suit this, um, where we actually encounter one another and, and have conversations with uh, uh, with less of a time limit than we might uh, kneeling next to one another at the altar. So again, I'm not taking away the power of the altar for encounter, uh, especially not encounter with love. Um, but I think we've seen, or at least I've seen, um, that that doesn't always work. Um, that that has not that's not done it. Um, one of the most distressing things uh, for me as a as a minister over the last couple of years was was that realization that um, even encounters that I thought were more powerful than just being a minister at the communion table or at the altar, um, you know, burying and marrying and baptizing and, and visiting people in the hospital um, wasn't sufficient to allow for a bridge to be built when it came time for uh, tribal division, uh, especially in 2020. And so, um, so, um, I think we have to look for other tables. And then um, the thing that, that I think is true, and, and I want to ratify this or verify this with, uh, with the community a little bit more, is that um, just being at the table, like you've been at a Thanksgiving table with your crazy uncle or whatever who holds different tribal views than you do, being at the table is not enough. Um, that we have to learn how to keep ourselves at the table, listen carefully, understand where our boundaries are, all those things are, are really important. And, and um, I think the altar creates the, the table that says we're family. And, and this is my crazy Uncle Jack. And, and he drives me insane, but I love him. And I'm going to try my best to stay here. And all of the other practices that we try to hold as Christians allow us to stay there and say, this is really triggering uh, something in me that is keeping me from loving my Uncle Jack. How can I practice uh, presence, active listening, forgiveness, healing, reconciliation? How can I do some of these other things better? Um, my hope is, and, and, and uh, Tom's actually had these conversations with me a good deal. Some of you will be hearing this for the first time, that we can take a look at the, the kind of formation offerings of the church and say to ourselves frequently, are these helping us be uh, become better practitioners of reconciliation or not better, better practitioners of loving our neighbor or not. And if they're just there for entertainment value, we don't have enough time for that anymore. Um, let's, let's toss those suckers and, and move toward uh, the things that help us be better practitioners. Thank you, Tom. Meredith. Yeah. I'm interested in when you talk about charity and outreach, mm -hmm. um, encountering what level of openness and respect for the other group, the other tribe is required for charity and outreach to bring about reconciliation. And, and I think about as a child, uh, we were on a trip out West and um, my father had arranged a trip for us, a tour of a Hopi reservation mm -hmm. with um, someone who lived there. And he took us around in his car. It was just the three of us. Um, to see the reservation and either traditional homes, there were um, shacks that people were living in, there were trailers and RVs that people lived in, but 
but there was one very well-maintained split level house. And my father said, who lives there? What's up with that house? And the local guide said, ah, that's the missionary and his family. Mm -hmm. And so I think about if you're like, you can't, is just doing charity, is just doing outreach enough? Or does there have to be a certain openness and a certain respect to actually move towards reconciliation? Sure. So, um, so charity and encounter are the, the, are the two, the two practices that I named, and both of them suppose that the person practicing them with an intent toward being a better ambassador of reconciliation or somebody who wants to be anti-tribal, we might say, um, wants to be anti-tribal. That, that, that's, the, that's the prerequisite, is that I'm doing this specifically so that I can work on that thing within me. Um, not necessarily so that I can work on reconciliation with this person that I'm going to encounter, though that may also be the case, um, but that at some level, this practice of, of crossing a boundary of division is going to, I know it's I, reliably, this is going to have a positive effect on me, um, is, is kind of the, the, the movement there. Um, and that doesn't just go for uh, for outreach or like compassion and mercy type ministries. Um, but for all other ministries, it would cause us to, like pilgrimage actually works that way as well. If I go on pilgrimage, knowing that I'm looking to see something holy in a context that's vastly different than my own, I'm going to travel on pilgrimage with the expectation within me that I'm the one who's going to change as a result of the encounter. And that's the type of practice uh, in that way that I'm looking for. Um, and then, Charity, uh, specifically what I'm, I meant by that uh, is charity across the boundary of division between me and the person that I am not reconciled with. Uh, and I, I, I may have said something about that just glancingly about, I, I did, about Paul's relationship to Rome and the church in Jerusalem and that he was asking Rome to give a gift to the people in Jerusalem. It's the, it was the the church centered in Jerusalem that said that the Gentile Christians in Rome couldn't be Christians. Uh, they had actually fostered the, the conflict that ended up being in Rome. And Paul's kind of audacity to say, yeah, but please give this gift because they're hurting uh, was the thing. And so here's, here's what I, I, I would suggest as a, as a potential practice. Um, that if I have this terrible disagreement with Meredith from the perspective of values and and tribal identity and what I should do with this stuff or, or whatever. Um, if I take the time to look for either the thing that she and I do both agree with and try to make some kind of charitable gift uh, in that way, or um, something that she agrees with that I disagree with that I can tolerate, right? And just try to say like, I can't agree with you on this thing. Um, but I see the good that this is doing and I'm going to try, even if it's just a small gift, but that gesture itself of giving that is a sacrificial loving act. And that that opens a gateway for further communication that would not be there if I closed myself off. That that is, um, that's one of the tremendous gifts that, that comes out of that. And again, I know that may sound, that, I, that should sound foreign to you. We are not told to do that right? Um, we're told to give only to those recipients that are either um, worthy of our pity or mercy or align with our values. And I'm not saying like, move all of your donations to the other thing. I'm just saying that when we put our money where our mouth is, uh, that our, our hearts can sometimes follow. Jesus said a thing about uh, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That if I can say my, my relationship with this person is valuable enough that I want to put some money into it um, and, and practice charity in that way, uh, there's, a, there's a chance my heart might follow as well. Again, not always possible, just a, a Christian practice that can be helpful. Uh, Sue? Sue, you had a question? Oh, yes. I, I just wondered if this is an example of what you're talking about. I mean, down the street from me on the corner of Chafin and Crabapple, there was a, an abandoned house and, and woods that had sat there empty for a long time. And then I saw a sign one day, it had been, it was being, re, you know, being rezoned for civic 
to change from residential to civic. And so it turns out the Roswell Mosque on Hook and Bridge is moving there. They haven't started building yet, but I thought that's great, you know? And I was worried about it, you know, it's next to a Southern Baptist church. And I told Tom Wilson, he said, that's America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought, you yeah. know, the signs are there, but they haven't started building yet. But yeah. one of these days, is that an example of what you're talking about? Yeah, uh, perhaps. You know, one of the or, things that, that exists for me is a, a parable of this in the life of St. David's is um, some of the ministries that have um, that have happened um, related to um, outreach to some of our, our Latin uh, neighbors or Latino and Latina neighbors. I know that there are people who hold positions um, very antagonistic toward uh, toward immigration policies that favor people who are living in our neighborhood. And I also know that some of those people have gone out of their way to provide food, clothing, shelter, money, um, et cetera, charity to people that on the other side like of, the, of that cognitive dissonance, uh, they would say, they shouldn't be in my backyard at all. And then they, but they're here. And, and so I'm going to practice this charity. That's a great example, I think, of if, if we can stay in that mode, then an encounter can happen that can eventually change me. Um, it's not necessarily about solving all the issues related to either immigration on the one hand or, um, or the complexities of our neighborhood involvement on the other hand. It's just that here is a way of my engagement that keeps me in this conversation that if I were to just say, I'm gonna close myself off, turn a blind eye and only listen to those things that, um, that create a feedback, a positive feedback loop for my own understanding of, of immigration, then I'm not, I'm not in that game anymore. So that, that, that may serve as an example of, of one of the possibilities there. And that's to, to pick one side. I'm not singling out uh, one side or another. I'm just, I, I've just seen that in the history of St. David's. I've raised my hand, so I'm exercising uh, executive uh, prerogatives, I guess. Um, I have a, uh, an observation kind of question. Um, in, in, stri in, the, in the striving for herd immunity mm. in this great tribe of ours, there is this incipient pull of individualism mm -hmm. that, that we are taught. It is a part of the morality of being an American. It is, yes. To strive and to celebrate individuality. How, how can we reconcile that sort of, those mores with the common good, mm -hmm. with, with the, the spirituality of the, the, the common good? A great, a, gr a really great question. And the short answer is in some ways we can't. We can understand more the nature of our subcultures um, and, and potentially we could agree on something that allows us, us to rise above or beyond certain uh, aspects of those subcultures. I skipped over a thing called uh, grid and group and <clears throat> I can kind of, I can pull up for you a, a, a shorthand way of looking at it. Let's, mm -hmm. let's do this. Um, this is, initially this was Mary Douglas. Um, eventually there became other people. So here is, uh, can you, I'm not sure if you can see that well. Yeah, you probably have that now. You may have to move the picture yes. of people's pictures uh, out of the way a little bit, but <clears throat> the, the basically cultures, subcultures, this, this is called cultural theory or cultural risk theory. Um, and this is a terrible graphic. If somebody's better at uh, PowerPoint stuff than me can help me out someday. Um, the cultures and subcultures begin to exist on uh, this, uh, this map with an X axis and a Y axis, right? The group uh, axis going from left to right relates to how, um, how deep and powerful our social bonds are 
And that can be within a function, within a family, within a subculture, within a, a society, a nation, et cetera. And, and the more we push to the right, the more bonded we feel toward one another. From bottom to the top is how formal our roles and dependency upon one another. So, um, so if we move all the way to the, to the very top, my role is completely dependent upon you. I do my thing, you do your thing. And if either one of us stops, we both die, right? Um, mm -hmm. And all the way at the bottom would be, I don't, we all just do this, the things we do. Um, so existing on this sort of spectrum is every type of family and society and clan and tribe that we've ever been in. Uh, and, and many, some many different versions of that. Um, generally speaking, most people would put many, many Americans uh, moving toward that bottom left quadrant, right? I should name something about each quadrant probably. Uh, so the top left quadrant fatalism is hyper individualism with absolute independence or, or dependence upon everybody such that I can't control my own life or destiny. And so people become, as you might imagine, pretty pretty distraught about uh, uh, their state in the world because they can't do anything to change it, right? The, the role of each person is formalized and dependent on each other, but I've got no bonding to this other person. Why would they care about me? Uh, I'm just gonna be a victim of, of life. Um, uh, bottom left corner is individualism in terms of, of social bond, um, but um, with a sense of like egalitarianism in the way that we uh, approach one another without the formal structures. So rugged individualism, I can pull myself up by my own bootstraps and do whatever I need to do as an individual. Um, top right is collectivism, very formal roles and, and very, very high bond. You can kind of imagine what that is in terms of collectivism. The Church of Acts, the early Christian church was a collectivist church, complete dependence upon one another uh, with a bond that caused them to die for one another. That's, that's the, uh, a positive way of looking at what that can be. And then the enclave uh, is the bottom right, right quadrant. So we are um, uh, egalitarian in the sense that um, we have low formality of dependence upon one another. Each person can kind of do their own thing, but that never works for very long. Uh, and so what ends up needing to happen is that, uh, that we establish a, a us versus them against the, whatever the dominant thing is. The enclave doesn't exist as a dominant uh, feature in society on its own. And then usually one person is kind of appointed as the charismatic leader that helps to redistribute resources because the group can't do it together because there's not enough of a grid function to, to have any sort of centralized authority otherwise. Um, so uh, America, generally speaking, doesn't exist uh, anywhere in this quadrant, uh, uh, or at least like the low end of this quadrant. Uh, we're not exactly in the center because, as you mentioned, Carlton, most of our, our mythologies, our national narratives, uh, most of Western philosophy leads us into um, somewhere pretty close to the center, but a little bit leaning toward that left, uh, left bottom uh, quadrant. Um, so understanding that alone helps a great deal in how we approach uh, some of these questions. And, and then the question might be, how do we get more synergy or movement toward uh, the center when needed? And I'm not sure that we've figured that out exactly. There are, um, I, I, I I've named Jonathan Haidt a number of times. He's, he's one who I think um, talks about this as it relates to our politics a great deal in a way that's very, very helpful. That if we, if we recognize the inherent sort of tribalism that allows us to move into enclaves or move into um, uh, societies that promote individualism without enough social bonding to also promote general we welfare, um, then we can say, gosh, these are not... Um, our, our, our democracy isn't representing the whole as well as sometimes it does one portion or another, one tribe or another. Can we create grounds on which our democracy might function again as a society um, 
uh, better. And Jonathan Haidt writes a lot about, you know, here are, uh, one of his examples is um, moving to uh, open primaries across the board. And I don't, I'm not, I don't know anything about politics. So, so again, I'm not, I'm not promoting this. I'm just naming it as something that he says. But if we do that, then you get more of the, of the central culture instead of the cultures that exist on the edges of the, of the, uh, of the map there. Um, the other thing that we, I think it's important to, to note, can, can see is that there's a movement from um, in these diagonals that people move from the bottom left to the top right and from the top left to the bottom right a little bit more than they move from the top left directly to the right. I can pull that back up if it's helpful to see it. Um, fatalists move into enclaves, right? They don't move into collectivist communes <laughs> as much. Uh, they, they tend to move down here. Um, individual, complete isolated uh, individualists uh, who begin to experience social bonding move this direction more than they move this direction. And if we can see that a little bit, then we might be able to address um, the stuff that needs to be kind of in here. Um, that's, again, uh, what we call pragmatic uh, centrism. It's not it's like political centrism. Um, it's, it doesn't say that the people on the left or the right don't have ideas that are better than the other. And we just need to stay in the center because the center is the place to be. Um, instead, it just says there is a place in the middle of all this where most of us exist most of the time. And the people on the edges tend to lie to us to try to pull us toward the edges. Um, that, I'm not sure if that's entirely helpful, uh, Carlton. And that's all uh, political. The one other thing that I'll say is, is and you, you did mention this, and I'm, uh, I'm ignoring it because it was easier to answer that question. Uh, what do we do as a, as a sort of Christian subculture? And the, and the answer has often been that we move ourselves into enclaves. Um, I'm, I, I think that um, if one of our goals stated in the, in the prayer that I'll pass to you all for, uh, for conclusion, as well as in the Diocese of Atlanta, is to uh, constantly expand the circle, right? Move ourselves from the tight, impermeable boundary in the center to these ever extending uh, concentric circles to, to gather more people in. If the tribe is everyone, instead of uh, just the people who are the, the us's, um, then I, I think we can't disengage. I, th I think we can't move into our enclave. There's a part of me that really wants to, that really says that, you know, the, the early Christian, the early, early Christianity was an enclave. Um, absolutely it was. The first three centuries we were an enclave against the, the larger dominant culture of the empire. Um, uh, we could theoretically go back to that place and still be really faithful. Uh, I'm just not sure that that's our calling in this moment. I think we might have some more witnessing to do before we, we give up on um, our, our place uh, where we uh, still have <laughs> the, the dying remnants of a microphone anyway that we can use uh, from time to time to, to call out to people uh, and bear witness to, uh, to love. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Remington. I know you you're you're kind of need to head on to your next um, your next thing in your day, but I wanted to just say thank you so much for coming and speaking with us. That tons to think about and and talk about and learn more about. So thank you, Lee. Remington. A round of applause, whether it's silent so. or not. So thank you so much. I yeah. appreciate coming. Lee, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, Deborah Felder had reached out to me and asked if I had resources. And I'm, yes. I, I did, I said I would share them in the middle of this presentation that I never actually even pulled up the presentation for you all. Um, would y'all like to see that? What can I do to help get that to people? You can send us a list. Okay. Yeah. We usually email it out afterwards. Um, okay. He sends it out afterwards. Or okay. Very good. I will yeah. do that. Like my, put it in my Amazon cart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're all books, unfortunately. There's one, one article that you can just read on the internet. Uh, but plenty of, you can also uh, Google any of those authors' names and, uh, and associate with it, like culture, tribe, 
conflict, any of those things, and you'll get all the stuff from the other people who've read those books. So just more people like me saying, hey, this other person's great, and I'm going to riff on their material for 30 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Remington. Great. Do you, do you have another minute? Yeah, I see sure. Bill. Bill. Bill Sleeper's hands up. Yeah, I, I was just going to, I was going to suggest maybe we could chip in and get one or two copies of these for our library and then share them that way. Sure, sure. Right. That'd be cool. I, would, uh, I guess no chipping in needed. We can just order those. <laughs> Got that. Got that. Cover that. Okay. Well, um, I think probably this is a good time to, to wrap up for the for the evening then. A um, couple things I wanted to, to say is that as we move into 2022, um, Common Purpose is reaching out to people who might be interested in joining our planning committee. Um, and so I would love if you're interested or you've been, in, been part of Common Purpose and been here at meetings or know someone who has attended, we'd love for you to reach out to us. You can reach out to Patty Kennard specifically or me, my email's in a lot of the stuff and I'm um, happy to answer any of your, your questions. It's a wonderful group and we really want to keep talking about being at the table. That's really the whole purpose of Common Purpose is to bring us together around the table and I know personally, I've learned so much from the years that I've been part of this, whether attending or on the planning committee. Um, and it's really brought me closer to a lot of my fellow parishioners um, and learned so much. And it really do, it, it does a lot of the things that you were talking about, Remington, where you, you've said sort of ways to bring us together with humility and listening. And um, so I really encourage you to, to consider that if that's in your heart or know someone who is. We'd love to have you as part of our group. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that we will have our next meeting Tuesday, January 11th, the second Tuesday of January. I don't believe we have a topic yet, but we have some, do we have a topic? We have some suggestions, but we haven't nailed it down yet. We have March's topic, but not January. So just be on the lookout for that. And I know the other thing I would ask you is we're um, looking into 2022, whether we're, we will be meeting in person again, which is something that we did. So if you have thoughts about that, whether you think that's a great idea or whether you think it's a horrible idea or whether it doesn't matter either way, I'd love to hear from you. So you can always email me as well, because that's something that, you know, we want everybody to feel comfortable and attend. But I think we're also thinking about maybe we can move back to in-person gathering. And I think that's it. Anybody else on the committee have anything to add that I've forgotten? No. All right. Well, we have our closing prayer that Remington has put in our chat. Would, would someone like to either um, I lost. Um, Bob, would you like to do the closing prayer? Do you have it in the chat or would you read? Yes, I do. I have it. Thank you. All right, let's pray. Oh God, who created all peoples in your image. We thank you for the wonderful diversity of races and cultures in this world. Enrich our lives by ever widening circles of fellowship and show us your presence in those who differ most from us until our knowledge of your love is made perfect in our love for all your children. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Thank Amen. you, everyone. Thank you again, Remington. Yeah, really thank you for having me, y'all. Oh, Love thank being here you. with you. Thank you so Thanks, much. everybody. Good Great. seeing everybody. Great. Have a good night. Bye. 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 To love uh, and serve the Lord. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Yeah, thank you, Carol. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> okay.